like to introduce some of our special guests to you. First of all, right up front, we have Mayor William Tate. From our city council, we have Sharon Rogers. Darlene Freed in the back. Let's go over this point and enough videos. Uh, I haven't seen Leon yet. He was supposed to come, but I haven't seen him yet. Uh, Duff O'Dell, where'd you like? Let's get the balls here. And then, uh, I just saw Bruno a second ago. We're going to run Wallace in the night. He's up city mayor. Mayor of the city. And I'm ready. And the assistant city manager and new Garden Club member is Jennifer Hibbs. Where's Jeff? We have our new director of Parks and Rec, Chris Smith. And as a speaker, we have our former Parks and Rec assistant director, Joe Moore. We have our fairly new uh, CBB director of festivals and events, Denton Bricker in the back. Next to him is our CBB festivals and events manager, Barry Felder. Our Grapevine Museum curator and former Grapevine librarian, Janice Roberson. We have our Grapevine Lions Club president, what William Wild Bill Nichols? <laughs> have not seen Greg Jordan yet. Is he here? He said, oh, sorry. <laughs> then our Texas Garden Club president, Gwen DeWitt, who came all the way from Bee Hill, Texas, to help celebrate with us. Gwen appreciate that. The rest of y'all are special, but I think we don't have time to introduce everybody. <laughs> so, as you can imagine, any club that's been around for 90 years has had many members and officers. So we invited all of the former presidents. So we'd like all the former presidents to stand so we can recognize you. You should know these people also have served on other positions in the club. <laughs> You all for coming. Unfortunately, after you know 90 years of history, unfortunately, many of our past presidents have also passed. <clears throat> so, in preparing for today, I did several hours of research to gather facts. However, it would have taken years if not for this book right here that tells the history of our club for the first 80 years. And I saw my own great thanks to Joetta King and other members of the club who compiled this book years ago. So thank you, Joetta. <laughs> Joetta is one of those people that does a lot for the club. But the research has given me great appreciation for the difference this club has made in our community throughout the years. And I hope this information presented today will help you all to appreciate our history as well. There are so many projects and accomplishments that had to be listed on the slides. And it, I'm sorry. There are so many projects and accomplishments that many had to be listed on the slides that were showing previously because we don't have time to talk about all of them. The larger projects will be presented today by our speakers. If I overlook any of your projects, I apologize in advance. Most cases, the names are not mentioned so that no one is overlooked. Joining us today as speakers, we have Joe Moore, the former assistant director of Parks and Recreation. Joe worked with us on many, many projects. Now we just back up a little bit. The reason we invited like Rotary Club, Alliance Club, CBB, Parks and Rec, all those people, is the club has worked with all these groups throughout the year and we appreciate the partnership. <clears throat> anyway, Joe has worked with many of you audience, but um, by the way, I wanted to mention too that our Parks and Rec Department, they're just babies. They celebrated 50 years <laughs> this year. <laughs> but they do a great job. You will see how during the last 50 years, our organizations have worked hand in hand on these amazing projects. 
Also joining us is Sharon Rogers, Grapevine City Councilwoman of 35 years, uh, Grapevine Garden Club member for 35 years, which makes her a Silver Circle member. In her early membership days, Sharon worked on many important projects and continues to support our club. And then our current president, Sherry Jones, will tell us about continuing projects that have been occurring, excuse me, numerous years, and our future projects. You're going to see the great Garden Club members have staying power to continue most projects for many years. Also, our club has evolved in many ways, including meeting places going from members' houses to much larger venues, <laughs> as well as the projects in the Jacob. The Grapevine Garden Club was organized on January 29, 1932 by 25 men and women, many of whom were descendants of the pioneer family, families. Their professions varied from bankers, teachers, pharmacists, farmers, and health bankers. These were leaders in the community whose names you see on street signs around Grapevine, like Boston, Box, Bouchon, Wall, Lucas, Ruth, Estelle, Star, Bohoy, and Yates, just to name a few. Some were business owners, and many who were involved in civic affairs, such as council, mayor, and city trust, excuse me, school trustees. Our membership has fluctuated over the years, but now we have over 200 members, with members from the surrounding communities, because we are a club, member, a club with so many activities. So let's do some comparison of Grapevine in 1932 wow. and present day. You try to picture this in your mind. The population of Grapevine in 1932 was approximately 1,000. Today, it's over 54,000. The fire department had one motorized truck that was pretty new to them and a few volunteers, no paid staff. The present day has five stations multiple types of apparatus and ambulances, and over 100 paid firefighters. The police department, they had the calaboose, which you all have seen on Main Street, and they had one pair of handcuffs, which I saw in the records they purchased just prior to 32, one pair of handcuffs, and they were, they were all volunteers too. Today they share the public safety building, with the fire department and have multitudes of vehicles and over 100 sworn officers. In 1932, Northwest Highway and Highway 114 both opened, but they didn't look anything like they do today. Picture grapevine without any of these businesses that are common or facilities that are common to us today. Grapevine Lake did not open. It's man-made in case you didn't know. It did not open until 1956. The Palace Theater, Gazebo on Main, DFW Airport, Grapevine Mills Malls, or any of the shopping centers that we have now, Walmart, Target, Sam's, none of those. The multitudes of restaurants that we have today also, even Wilboids was a one-stop automotive garage at that time. The CDB building, public safety building, City Hall, Gaylord, and Great Wolf were non-existent. And some of those areas were farmland or undeveloped prairies. Grapevine Main Station, there was no tourist train or commuter train, only the Cotton Belt Railroad that transported freight and some passengers. Though many of the original train station buildings have been preserved and still stand. There were only 230 homes in Grapevine. I don't even know where the number is today, and it's growing still. You're going to find this hard to believe <laughs> that William D. Tate was not our neighbor in 1932. <laughs> he would not even be born for 10 more years. <laughs> Happy 80th birthday, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Remember that picture? <laughs> The Grapevine Garden Club was organized for the same mission that we have today, 
promo interest in flowers, gardens, horticultural and floral design, further the protection and conservation of wildflowers. Whoops, sorry. <clears throat> and shrubs and trees, stimulate appreciation and protection of birds, promote city and highway beautification, and encourage education, I'm sorry, actively support environmental concern and encourage education, all these objectives. So it sounds like a tall order, but I think you'll see that we lived up to this challenge and proudly continue it today. The founding members got off to a quick start. In 1932, they adopted the slogan, Another Tree in Every Yard. There were 230 homes in Red Line at that time. There were 255 roses, 3,504 shrubs, 272 shade trees, and 143 fruit trees, a total of 4,174 plants planted in 1932 for those 230 homes. Under the influence of the garden club. Yay! That's a great start. <laughs> sorry, I forgot. Yeah. Sorry, I apologize. I was the part of the bio of Joe took for us. Oh, sorry, at the table. So, our first speaker is Joe Moore. He's a graduate of Stephen M. Austin University in Nacogdoches, and he graduated in forestry and recreation. He then worked for 36 years in the municipal parks field for the cities of Tyler and Grapevine from 1978 to 2014. In 2002, his team began managing the Vintage Campground, which as we all know is beautiful and award-winning and he achieved the State Campground of the Year four times and the National Campground of the Year Award from the National Association of RV Parks and Campgrounds Association, ARVC, in 2012. After completing the RV Parks and Campground Management Graduate School in 2006, Joe Welcome initiated 20 Room 4, a non-competing group of campground owners and managers who shared business information to better their respective campgrounds. Upon retirement, he became the executive director of that group. <clears throat> After retiring from municipal work in 2014, Joe formed Joe Moore's Campground Consulting, providing services across the USA and Canada. His projects and clients range from ground up construction development to assessment and operational efficiency for multi million dollar resorts to begin an instructional speaker, sorry, to being an instructional speaker at the National Campground Management School and ARVC conferences. He currently sits on the ARVC Board of Directors, Executive Committee as the Secretary. In his any spare time that he has, he spends of one of his East Texas properties, helping out in his hometown of Mineola. Joe's been married to Peggy for 46 years, and they have two children, two grandsons, and a granddaughter on the way in November. So I'd like to introduce Joe Moore. Trees, seeds, and flowers for the first and second place winners. <laughs> you take that and maybe add a dollar to it, and you can get a cup of coffee at Starbucks nowadays. And that's about it. But it was a start, and that's the seed that was planted. You know, two fifties too low. <laughs> um, then in 1944, uh, well, I'm, I'm just gonna forgot about Keith Gray by Bugle. Fast forward. This is really, we, we got a grant, the city, and we, I'm gonna use that interchangeably because I still feel a part of the city. But we got a grant, grant in uh, 1989, a $20,000 grant from the governor's energy office to start a, a recycling program. And this is uh, kind of the start of the Keep Grapevine Guilford, it extended uh, in a continuation, really, of uh, the efforts that the Garden Club had started. But this was our first flyer. I just I found it in my archives. I gave one to, to Joanna to keep. Uh, 
my son and daughter and nephew there in that picture of our oh, <laughs> holding the holding the globe. They got the whole world in their hands, just as you all. But you can see we we did a program, Joetta. Um, we had uh, several many people helping out, volunteer for those of you who've been around. Remember underneath the water tower downtown, uh, caught them. Miss Butterfield, Col Colleen Butterfield would help us, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts would help us collect glass bottles and newspaper and cardboard. And it went from there to now look what's going on, fall sweet. Working with the uh, Keep Great by Beautiful department, we, we uh, coined it. I was kind of coordinating the Keep Great by Beautiful program. And early on, most Keep Great by Beautifuls in the state or keep whatever beautiful it's just their name keep austin beautiful as kdb keep dallas beautiful as kdb we didn't want to be kgb <laughs> but, i mean one of our early on committee persons had an issue with that because there was some connection with them really in real life and so hence in the bylaws that were set up it is keep great by beautiful the acronym would always be kgbb it just rolls off the tongue right KGBB. KGBB. so here they are still going forward I, should, I still support this organization because it, it means so much to this city and to me. I mean, the, I don't know, how many times anybody picked up trash around the lake? Yeah. Anybody picked up trash just one time and it's all clean? No. <laughs> it's always, always there. So it's an ongoing thing. You know, the old, the old adage about uh, don't be a litter bug. You all remember that in the olden days? We're still saying it. We don't lose that. We never get fully grasped what it means to keep things beautiful. And it's an ongoing, we have people that leave, new people come in, and they need to be made aware of what the programs are that the city has to offer. What do I have up there? Oh, the touring cabin. Oh my gosh. The touring cabin, I'm not gonna go into the full history of that, but that was quite the undertaking. <laughs> What was the lady's name that uh, painted everything? Alberta. Alberta. Alberta Neville. This cabin was actually set up over in the South Lake area. And the city wanted to say that it had, they had one day or one week to move this thing. And she went in uh, with fingernail polish and marked all the logs. She ran out of fingernail polish and I think then she started using lipstick. But you could still go inside the building and you could see those letterings because they wanted, when they took it down, they wanted to make sure it was put back up the right, the right way. I had the, uh, the honor of, of maintaining that within my purview of my, of my position. Worked on it many times, rechanging it and setting the, the chimney up straight, but the Garden Club is the one that did the first uh, landscaping around it. Uh -huh. And I'm, and I'm, this is as good a time as any. Joetta knows this better than anybody. The number of projects that we did together. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, but for whatever reason, we all change. We don't all look the same we did. Ten years ago. <laughs> we don't all live in the same houses, some me, as we did 10 years ago. But some of the projects that we worked on, it, it almost, it, it's, it's not laughable, but it is sometimes. But many projects that we would do, the city would progress and those projects would get torn up, moved. How many? I mean, almost all of these, except people. This project was great. You can see we had folks, Reed Jones and, and uh, Ed King, Ron Ruggiero. Uh, doing all this stuff. I remember when these came in, planning, planning these things. Our lovable Ed Hewitt up there, over here, leaning up against the hoe. But however unfortunate it was, it came to realize that, that irrigating those plants along the, the building, this historic building, uh, we got termites. And it was recommended that we give it a three foot buffer of no plantings. And so the landscaping directly around the building was pulled out. But the trees that were planted, uh, the old sign is not there any longer, I don't think, is it? No, it's been long gone. But you can see the bald cypress 
really kind of out of character, but some Alzheimer's is there, uh, right behind it. Man, that's still, it's still there. Uh, the Torrey Cabin was one of those big projects that Linda was referring to. Made a big impact. It's right on Main Street, and uh, people can see it, and uh, really go in there. And the Historical Society does a great job of going in and updating that and changing things around uh, from time to time. The next big project we got is, as she mentioned, the Heritage Garden. This is over in the Heritage Garden, was down at the end of where the blacksmith shop. Uh, it was another one of those that, that we built <laughs> through a grant from the TCEQ, I believe is the name of it. The TCEQ has had a half a dozen different names in its history. Texas Water Quality Board and the, a bunch of different things. Train wreck is what we call it now. Uh, it's not a train wreck, TCEQ. But now that was the Texas Resource Natural Conservation Council. That's what. But they, uh, they took a piece of land down there at the end of the blacksmith shop to make it to an educational garden. We got a grant to build a pavilion in the, in the garden club. So this would be a great learning experience. The little pavilion is still saying, the last time I checked, is it still there? <laughs> The little building that's back there, it's still there, right? <laughs> Things change, but we've got to make sure. But uh, brought in uh, a heritage pass-along thing. These are older plants that have done so well that, that people have grown in their yards, been around for, for decades. And this was a good way to uh, instruct and help kids learn the plants. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, it also had other plans in the future, and a lot of those plants then were dug up and relocated along with the statue that I don't think it's, yeah, we might have, there we have a picture over the right. Statue has been relocated over to the Botanical Gardens. So here we have some, uh, some photos of the work going on. We already have the, uh, the water tower from Wagon Wheel Ranch. Y'all remember that? Kathy Br uh, Brunson says, says hello from out in Burris, Texas, horse ranch out in, uh, in Van. Uh, and it was, a, it was a labor of love. And for those of you who don't know me, garden club folks, at that time, I was not uh, writing those grants. But we had somebody that evolved right here on this stage, if you recall. Johnny Wildflower came to life. Johnny, Johnny came to life. He was the one that uh, Larry Wilhelm, is his real name. But Johnny uh, Wildflower promoted Wildflower painting and would help in the writing of grants. Uh, that we were able to uh, share with uh, the Garden Club and others in the city. The Botanical Garden, the crown jewel of the Garden Club, the crown jewel of, of this region uh, to be, you know, compared to the Fort Worth of Botanical Garden, the Dallas Arboretum of a town this size. To have something like this for uh, Shane Wilbanks to be able to have that foresight and the power to push that forward to make it a reality was just awesome. Uh, as you know, it uh, was started way back, well, a few years back, it actually started when Miss Smith, Betsy Mitchell passed away. Uh, we were, the city had plans in the uh, master planning of our Parks and Rec Department to acquire that should it ever come about. Mayor Tate was handling the estate and uh, contacted the city manager. It was it Bruno at the time? That's Roger. I think Roger Nelson. And we acquired the building and uh, renovated it, used it for an event meeting space at the same time, and then bought some additional land on down the road to develop into this. It was a very unique uh, topography back in there. There was a lot of small saplings, uh, two to three inches in, di in diameter, that kind of covered up what the actual topography was, but it was a very a bowl shape. And we, we can only calculate because over on the other side of the creek behind the house, uh, there's some mounds out there. At one time, that little creek that barely flows was almost a river, it had come down through there and had eroded these, these areas out long before grapevine was probably found. As you see here, the signage that was put out there, it's, it's elevated itself. You can remember the uh, Torrey Cabin sign was kind of the, still most, the same motif, but this is a little more contemporary. It was going to last a little bit longer. Um, she did give me notes to read about some of this stuff. <laughs> um, 
So it goes back that uh, in 1995 is when the master plan called for this, uh, the botanical gardens, and we, Shane being the one who did it, uh, Doug Evans, uh, director of Parks and Recreation, he and I worked together for 19 years. He would be here today, but he is traveling as he always does. He's up in uh, South Dakota. Uh, but he, the, Doug and uh, Shane, uh, decided that this was uh, something that we need to, to work on. They, uh, we, the city contracted with an architect named Oliver Wyndham in 1999. He's also the one that uh, designed the Fort Worth Botanical Garden. So we thought we had somebody uh, that knew what they were talking about. Ramblin' Blake then constructed the, the, uh, the project. And it, as you well know, the Garden Club members know, is an ongoing thing. It, was, it just kept evolving, kept evolving. And I'm sure there's other things that I'm unaware of that are still going on there to this day, education and growing of plants and such. Uh, in 2006 and seven, <clears throat> um, the uh, Garden Club said, you know, it's, it's time. It's time to really make a statement in this town. And they set out to raise $50,000 to build the, uh, the, ten, the uh, greenhouse. But before they did that, they wanted an educational pavilion just on the back side, on the south side of the, of the town of the uh, And it was done, it took five years to develop this thing, and Edith Pewitt was a big stronghold, bless her, and Edith and Ed Pewitt, uh, we owe a lot to them for what they brought to the table. Um, thought about bringing a hole out here. Those of you who know Ed Pewitt, he always had his hole. I jumpstart. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we dedicated this in 2005. This was the uh, uh, pavilion that was uh, built back there, the educational pavilion. Those of you that contributed have your names on the, on the wall there, carved in stone. And it's, it's a, a place for the community to come and share their thoughts, their, their dreams, and, and to have, have events. The ribbon cutting there with, uh, with Sharon and Shane and Edith and Mike and uh, Marion, uh, others that, that were there. And today, it sits in, in amongst those redbud trees, uh, so beautifully located down in there. Uh, but to go with that, as I mentioned, we have the greenhouse project. Uh, this was another project that we got it. The city got a grant for, and we're able to build and use it for uh, for growing up plants. It's, is it fully stocked, fully full now? Is it got all kinds of stuff in there? Yeah. Chris, did our horticulturist make it? Yeah, okay. no. I get to meet him, her, Trace. 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 I get to meet. You know, you all, uh, horticulturists, tend to look down, being a forester. <laughs> I tend to look up. So that's, that's, not, that's the definition. That's what we do. So, uh, but this this was a labor of love also to build this thing and to have something that you all can set your your uh, uh, foundation on and do. And it's from what I've I've heard, it's been received throughout the region as a very good, nice greenhouse for for not just a great mind to learn and, and use, but others as well. Well, Rusty, uh, Rusty Walker there has since retired. Was he was helping in some of that going on? So, aside from the awards, that's a picture taken last week of me. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> no, that was back in 1990, 22 years ago. We appreciated what the Garden Club did then, and I know the city. Uh, the council, the parks department, and the people appreciate what you do now because you've made an impact. You're 90 years young, and you've got a long way to go. And that's why I say, happy anniversary, 1932 to affinity. Thank you all very much. change of microphone and, and uh, PowerPoint. I'd like to mention that uh, I want to thank Wild Bill Nichols from the 
Grapevine Land Club. He brought us a $100 donation when he came in today. Wow, wow. When Joe was talking about the Deep Grapevine Beautiful, it reminded me when I first moved here, I, well, when I worked out to the directory company, I worked for a guy who came here from New Jersey, and he once told me that he thought the saying, don't mess with Texas, was a threat. He didn't realize it was a, it was a no littering campaign. He thought that's how Texans were. You know, we get mad about it. Not to hide the text. Okay, so our next speaker is going to be Sharon Rogers. She moved to Grapevine in 1975 and with a love of landscaping, plants, and wildlife, joining the Grapevine Garden Club was high on her to-do list. Sharon was appointed to the Planning and Zoning Commission in 1979 and served as chair for four of her six years on the PNZ. She was elected to Grapevine City Council in 1985 and has been re-elected every three, three years since that time. She has served on the Council's Facilities Committee and has been involved in the construction or remodeling of all city buildings since first elected, including City Hall, Grapevine Public Library, Convention Center, all the fire stations, Convention and Visitors Bureau Headquarters Building, the Public Safety Building, and most recently, the Golf Course and Animal Shelter. That's a lot of new buildings. Yeah. Sharon serves on the Board of Directors of the Tarrant Regional Transportation Coalition and is a member of the Grapevine Historical Society, the Grapevine Chamber of Commerce, and is the current president of Grapevine's Bayview Club. She's a charter member of the Grapevine Heritage Foundation and has served on the Baylor Hospital Development Council. So please wear, excuse me, welcome Sharon Rogers. and to speak about the early days of the club and highlight just a few of the many activities and accomplishments. A couple of them that I will just briefly mention, Joe has already very nicely explained, we all need the details, so uh, it's, it's hopefully going to be a well-rounded uh, opportunity. Uh, as we've heard, the Great Vine Garden Club was formed in 1932 by a group of 25 civic-minded citizens for the purpose of promoting an interest in gardens and garden design. Their interest also included protecting wildlife and native plants and beautifying the city of Grapevine. The club's dues were set at 25 cents. <laughs> and they had determined that no refreshments had to be served. No refreshments would be served. Well, they didn't last long. Uh, it wasn't long before popcorn balls were served at one of the meetings, after which everybody loaded up and went to the city water plant and planted a redbud tree. That was the club's tree. By 1937, just five years after the club was organized, 747 trees had been planted in public areas and along Grapevine highways, all donated by Garden Club members. Now, you'll recall that Grapevine was a farming community. Crops were harvested, especially came up in a whole lot of cotton. They were brought to downtown to be shipped out to markets. They were loaded on trains. As the years and decades passed, though, the fertile bottom land along Denton Creek, just north of downtown, was acquired by the Corps of Engineers to create Great Vine Lake. Then a few years later, over 9,000 acres of prime, rich, black land prairie in the Great Vine Prairie. Well, those 9,000 acres were acquired, and that became DFW International Airport. So the bumper crops that had been grown on the Great Vine Prairie no longer were grown. There was nothing to ship out, and there were no passengers on the trains. As a byline, over half of the DFW airport is in the city limits of Grapevine. And a lot of it, of course, was the very fertile land. So with no, uh, no trains needed, no crops to ship, no passengers to ride on the train, the Cotton Belt Railroad decided to demolish the depot because it was no longer in use. Therefore, it was surplus, and it had no purpose. 
Well, the president of this wonderful Great Vine Garden Club that year was Mrs. Alberta Nettleton, as we've heard, and she got wind of the railroad's intention, and she was not happy. <laughs> now, I can say this, Alberta was about this tall, okay? <laughs> just a little shorter than I, but she was a ball of fire. Um, so she rounded up several of her good garden club friends, and they decided that they would not allow the depot to be demolished, and they wanted to acquire it. But what would they do with it when they got it? It's kind of like a dog chasing a car. What's he going to do with that car if he ever catches it? <laughs> so they hurriedly gathered together and made a plan, and they went to the city council meeting and spoke, and they asked the city if the city might have a location where the depot could be placed. The city said yes. Well, the Garden Club could acquire it, and it could be moved to the city's park on Ball Street, which we now know of as Heritage Park. Let's see if I can get this right. So the depot was moved. Everyone, the city, and the Garden Club ladies all agreed that it would become a historical museum. There's a picture of it today, a Grapevine Historical Museum. And uh, it sat there for a number of years, and the Calaboose was moved there, and it sat uh, beside the museum for a number of years as well. Well, Alberta wasn't through. She uh, soon called all of the ladies' organizations in town together to discuss creating a Grapevine Historical Society. It was officially chartered by the state of Texas in the spring of 1974, and Alberta then began soliciting donations of artifacts that were of historical significance to Grapevine for display in the city's first museum. The Cotton Belt Depot remained in the park, the park, on Ball Street several years before finally going home to its original location on Main Street beside the railroad tracks. And of course, that is where it sits today. On a very, very hot July the 4th weekend, John Stewart, you'll remember this, you and Roy were there, uh, just after the depot had been moved home, a group of volunteers applied a primer coat of paint. Uh, since then, the depot has been fully restored, and it is one of the crown jewels in our city, as we know. This is a reminder, I think, of the good that just one person can bring about that lasts the ages. The actions of that one little lady, one little lady, and leading the charge not only saved the depot, but it also gave birth to the Grapevine Historical Society, of which Alberta was the first president. As it turned out, though, Alberta still had more to do, which Joe mentioned a moment ago. The Torian cabin was uh, in the country out northwest of here, probably what's now the South Lake City limits. Uh, it was in very poor condition, and the owner dictated uh, that it had to be torn down, which Alberta rounded up her gals, and they got to work, and that Torian cabin was moved. It was all put back together. That was no small feat, because she had to get out several tubes of lead stick and pick out polish, and uh, have some uh, uh, heavy lift lifters disassemble all the logs put it back together, and uh, of course it says in Liberty Park across the street from City Hall today. I had this picture in my collection, and it just makes me so happy to see what that whole little area looks like at Christmas time, so I thought that might be something that you all would enjoy seeing as well. One person, one person, who had a desire to do things to make her community a better place makes me feel how fortunate we all are to live here today. I've had a lifelong personal interest in uh, plants and in wildlife. Uh, my grandmother instilled that in me. She had a yard that was all flowers, kind of cottage garden type of landscape, I think, back in the she lived in the country. They had lived with blade grass. Uh, you name it, she could grow. A woman could put a stick in the ground, and in not too long of a period of time, it would be full of green leaves and full of full of blooms, and it was just beautiful. And I love anything that blooms, and have proceeded to try to grow a few things through the years. Some were successful, some not, too much, not so much, but I especially enjoyed birds. Uh, all of them except crows, of course. And uh, so uh, through the years, uh, Jerry and I were fortunate to have some peacocks. And this began when a female and a male peacock escaped from the 
uh, right by the high school's ecology center, <laughs> and landed uh, in the area where we live. And of course, it's very hard to catch a bird. It's up in the trees, very tall trees. So, so that uh, effort was discontinued, and I wound up being able to make friends with them. And those peacocks had just brought endless joy uh, through the years, uh, along with uh, various and sundry other birds and other wildlife that, uh, that we have. Uh, every day and every evening, we have a variety of critters that, uh, that comes through the yard. Uh, and I get to feed some of them, which is a, a special joy for me, not having any children of my own. I feed the birds. Uh, last night, we had uh, a coyote, or more than many, more than one, that traipsed through the yard during the night, three of them. Uh, we also had two foxes. Uh, the bobcat came last week, and, and of course, we have the usual armadillos and, and skunks occasionally, possums, raccoons. Um, I had been doing a lot of gardening and landscaping uh, in our yard and came across a magazine article that was written by the National Wildlife Federation. And it was about becoming a certified backyard wildlife habitat. So I decided that's something that I wanted to pursue. Uh, and I quickly filled in and filled out the application, sent in the required documentation. And when the certificate arrived in the mail, I, it was a very happy day, and we were number 3930. I know a lot of members in this club have become a member of the Backyard Wildlife Habitat Program. It's a great program. If you're not a member, we'll check it out. Uh, it's just a fun thing to do. But it wasn't long before the National Wildlife Federation's newsletter arrived in the mail, and it contained an article about the Arbor Day Foundation's program there, Tree City USA. And that required uh, everything that we could, could do. We already had the requirements met except for one thing, and we would need to start an annual Arbor Day ceremony. Well, I was hooked when I read that article. And you know, timing is everything. It uh, was just uh, a few months after I read that article that I was elected to the city council. And one of the first things I did was go uh, and meet with and send a memo to our city manager, Jim Hancock, wonderful man, and suggested that we pursue the city becoming a tree city USA. Uh, and so we contacted the garden club and uh, established uh, that effort through the garden club. Our, uh, and then also we already had our tree preservation ordinance, which ordinance has been used as a model throughout uh, various cities in the, in the United States. As a side note, I still have the memo I sent to the city manager requesting that we pursue being a tree city USA. And uh, I had it uh, framed at one time, like I dropped the frame and the frame broke. So it's now residing in a, in a very special place in the safe. Uh, as I was putting this PowerPoint uh, together, I was really happy to see a number of photographs about our organized ceremonies through the years that Linda was kind enough to provide to me. Thank you, Linda. And so I'm going to scroll through some of these. There's Joe Moore, uh, just taken a couple of days ago. His hair is still really, really dark. <laughs> and the Torian cabin is in the background on the left. And these were a group, of course, of, of students that attended because the, the Garden Club, one of the things they did was try to partner with the schools and, and, and start educating the youngsters so that they can have an appreciation for nature and wildlife. Uh, and planting to learn how to be good stewards of the natural resources uh, that we have. The man with the shovel was, was a mine burger. He was a meteorologist on Channel 4, wasn't he, Joe? One of Four or eight, okay. And, uh, and he was out here occasionally and, and was very supportive and uh, always made mention of it on his program. <coughs> uh, again, this is the uh, high school uh, students on the left. Steve Hogan was our. Uh, Arborist, was that his title with the Forest Department? Oh, he was the horticulturist. He was the horticulturist, thank you. And uh, he was always present and talking to the students, and, and uh, they will receive him very well because he really had a knack of interacting with the students and explaining about the plants and what's required. And, and uh, so that was the tree planting uh, that particular year, 1990. Uh, there's Ed here in the left photo with his hat and some of the other. Uh, participants. This was Johnny Wildflower, I think, in the, with, in the head on the right picture. Uh, again, there were some students around uh, celebrating Arbor Day. Uh, Joetta, uh, 
in the top right picture, and of course, so I'll make that so it's Spiegler now with the right name. Uh, and various and sundry other ladies. 1992 was a very memorable day. Memorable Arbor Day. Joe was grimacing over here. Uh, it was very cold. It was like 34 degrees. The wind was out of the north about 40 miles an hour blowing off Great Lake Lake when we were at Oak Grove Park. And you can see Steve Huddleston is on the left. He's got his coveralls on, gloves on. We all have on boots. I, I had uh, every layer of clothing on I could possibly get under that coat. And they had on headgear, I just had a head full of hair. And, and, and that kept me sort of warm, but it was very cold. But we were mighty and we were determined and we got that tree planted. Uh, Linda Cramp had a better job and uh, uh, the mayor spoke, he's in the top right. This was in 2002. And here is the 20th anniversary of the city being a tree city USA. Uh, Joe's on the right, Doug Evans on the left, of course. And this was, uh, what, eight years ago when we were planting adjacent to the library. And that's the tree adjacent to the library. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Through the years, the club has funded, provided funds and installed landscaping in numerous places around the city. This is one of them. The uh, 1985 uh, project of the, the Garden Club Selectic was landscaping at the police and library building, uh, which is the building on Dallas Road. Uh, and this was an award that was presented to the Garden Club for that project. It was presented to the city council meeting. That's Kevin Conklin. He was the Parks and Recreation Director at that time. And then in 1986, the club's beautification project was the creation of the uh, I, the landscape island at the corner of Wall Street and Dove Road, it was named the Sesquicentennial Island. And you can see some hard workers there. Obviously it was uh, probably a little bit warmer than it uh, was the, the previous years. They got out there, they laid the rocks, they, they bagged up the debris that was there, they spread out the mulch, and uh, just provided a lot of manpower and of course the funding for this project. Two years later, that's what it looked like. That's Norma Ruggiero there. And, and then a few years later, still, that's what it looked like with blue bonnets in the background, Mary Brennan on the left, up three to it on the right. Delightful ladies who worked really hard uh, for the club. And then in 19, let's see, 1988, this was another big project uh, that the club undertook. It was a beautification project. Uh, on the uh, traffic islands at Dove Road and Northwest Highway, which is on the right, Fox Rail is in the background. And the picture on the left is the median on Clark Boulevard at the Northwest Highway. And again, you can see a, a lot of work there. They partnered with Parson Red, and it was a joint effort, and there uh, was a lovely uh, creation there whenever they could finish a lovely project. <laughs> At times through the years, the club members have also helped with landscaping at the gazebo. Again, the Torian Cabin, as Joe mentioned, the depot, Grapevine Housing Authority, Grapevine High School, the Anita's View and Education Pavilion, the greenhouse at the Grapevine Botanical Gardens, some of which generated awards from affiliated gardening organizations, city departments, and of course, the Grapevine City Council for the club's tireless work. Garden club members were instrumental in organizing uh, Grapevine, uh, keep Grapevine beautiful to help further the club's beautification efforts throughout the city and they were influential in creating the Grapevine Botanical Gardens where members uh, still serve as docents. The Grapevine Garden Club remains true to the purpose and interest of its founding members to promote interest in gardens and horticulture, further the protection and conservation of native plants, stimulate appreciation and protection of birds, promote highway and city beautification. They walked their talk. You all have. Um, you encourage education and encourage, encourage students to learn about the joys that nature can bring. We are all proud of the Great Mind Garden Club. Our citizens enjoy and appreciate the beautification projects this club has created for our community. In honor of the many contributions of the Garden Club, 
uh, our mayor, the Honorable William D. Taylor, for playing for this entire year of 19, uh, 2022 <laughs> as the year of the Great Lakes Garden Club. The proclamation he presented earlier this year, which was displayed on the screen uh, just a little while ago, recognizes the club's innumerable <laughs> projects and many contributions to the high quality of life we all enjoy and the club's commitment to continued involvement in our community. So on behalf of the City of Grapevine, thank you, thank all of you for all you have done and continue to do, and congratulations for these 90 great years. <laughs> Okay, our last speaker today is our current president, Sherry Jones. And in order to do a biography, I had to kind of nudge her a little bit to get some more information out of her about her background. And I think you'll find this as interesting as I did. And it doesn't surprise me because she's got a very kind heart. Sherry got her first degree in nursing back in the 1960s from the University of Nebraska. Later, she found her calling when she got her master's in occupational therapy from TWU in 1980. <clears throat> she loved her 10 plus years working in rehab with patients with spinal cord injuries and traumatic brain injuries. She later worked in a hand clinic. Sherry and Roger have been proud residents of Grapevine since 1993 when they moved here from Earth, they moved up. <laughs> Prior to that, they enjoyed Lake Grapevine where they launched their boat. Back, in, back then, uh, Grapevine was a much smaller town. Sherry joined Grapevine Garden Club in 2005. She had no expertise or certifications in gardening, just an interest in learning and taking part in the many programs. She's chaired a few of these, and this is her second year as president of this great organization. Sherry Jones. We also have the annual craft fair that has gone on since uh, 1990. Not only do our members share a love of gardening, many of them have other talents. We have some that weave beautiful scarves as we can even view right over here on Sandy today. We have, uh, they're making jelly. And uh, many other things like handbags. So, uh, this will be fabulous that we have the last in October. We'll be able to participate in that. And this is something that will definitely continue to be beautification of the community. And there were influential in this community, in, of the community in this club. There were um, postman, a doctor, a minister, a librarian, a teacher all with the common goal. Home, we don't go in their backyard and tour what's growing and what they're having problems with. So been a part of our meetings from from the beginning. Um, the now they have to be more scheduled. We're a large group and we have uh, garden tours before uh, after meetings in the spring and the fall and in fact Susie is in the back hoping to get some more volunteers for for the fall we also now have what we call open gardens and that's a time when somebody can say hey I've got something just looking fantastic in my garden and I would love to invite visitors and so it's at the time that is convenient for the for the homeowner Trips and tours that we now call Gardeners on the Go have been around for, um, we've done that for many years. The, um, it's a, this is an expansion of touring beyond our own gardens in the Metroplex and sometimes some, some of the trips are even overnight. So we've, ha we've had lots of fun trips. <laughs> I hear somebody laughing. They must 
recognize a trip that they took. <laughs> the, the wine? Yeah, that would, that would definitely be on top of the list. <laughs> Plant sales. Thinking of what our plant sales are like today, I loved reading that in 1935, the club had $2. And the Federation dues were $3, no, excuse me, $5 that were due to be paid. So to raise that extra $3, the, a flower exhibit and plant seed sale was held. Every member planted one or more flats of plants to secure as many seeds as possible, and they also had a native plant exhibit. The event was a success and made a profit of $14.20. But $14.20 in 1935 equated to $302.80 today. So they made some good money and got their dues paid. So now in 2022, the plant sale raised this past year a record $15,829 to be used as scholarships. Something to really be proud of, of course. Scholarship recipients is how this plant sale money is used. Um, we have a lot to be proud of in our scholarship program. Since 1985, we have awarded 42 recipients scholarship. Well, yeah, 42 different people, recipients, and they have had majors in horticulture or environmental conservation related studies. Some of these apply again for a second year, which means that we have, a, we have awarded 75 scholarships. So that has amounted to a total of $145,500. So that is quite um, a feat for us to have, have done. So we can say a total of 75 scholarships to be very proud of. <coughs> One of the programs that uh, we feel has offered a lot to beautify the grapevine is our Civic Seed. And this began 14 years ago. Grant money from this project is given to applicants who identify a need uh, in Grapevine or Grapevine Colleyville Independent School District property that follows the Garden Club mission of gardening. And you saw that long list of our mission and so they apply for it. It might be protection or conservation of wildflowers, shrubs, and trees, uh, protection of wild birds, city or highway beautification, and of course, education of children. Some of the recent recipients are listed on that slide. There's been many others. Um, the goal pre pre originally was a, to award five $200 uh, projects each year and this has been increased recently to $300 so this is um, and, and a lot of volunteer hours especially like working in the gardens of the with the school children and helping them learn more about gardening <coughs> we do have the West Texas beautification project that we have done for 17 years <coughs> Susie Guckel said that back in 2006, the Garden Club members were needing a new place to dig dirt. And the folks at the housing authority units on West Texas Street were elderly and in some of them in poor health and they were needing help. So the Garden Club saw this as a, a great match. And Susie has led this group for uh, all these years to landscape and maintain the beds of these units. Many of these uh, residents have friendships and are very appreciative of our uh, efforts to, to help them.
program. Uh, volunteers have gone into the third grade classrooms where they uh, take a book that has been provided by the uh, Parks and Recreation Department. The schools vary, but it's been like three, cl three classrooms in some of the schools. It's really an opportunity to teach the joys of planting and caring for trees, as uh, well as the value of trees. They, they also demonstrate how to plant the seedlings and read a book to them, and each child re was receiving a redbud seedling. I really enjoyed, I had a neighbor receive one of those when he was in third grade and he now graduated from college. So it's been a lot of fun to watch this redbud tree grow and know <clears throat> This pro program has been in conjunction with the Parks and Recreation Department who provided the books and the seedlings. Now in 2022, as we move forward, this program is transitioning to what we call the Native Texas Tree Program. Uh, it will be in the fall, which is a much more appropriate time for planting trees. The volunteers will still go into the schools and read a book and uh, have the educational aspect of it. it then the, there's efforts being made to encourage the children to participate in Arbor Day events. So this will be a, a, a good transition, I think, for this program. So we've had lots of good times with that. Then there's the Butterfly Flutterby the program that we've been involved in for 24 years. Uh, this is a We've partnered with the Grapevine Convention and Visitors Bureau, and this is a celebration of the migration of monarchs from Canada to Mexico. And this family event, as you all know, starts as a parade, and the children are in costume. It just amazes me what some of these mothers are able to concoct for some butterfly costumes for their children. <coughs> And then the Garden Club members are, uh, have a big part at the end of the parade and in the Botanical Gardens. We man booths for uh, arts and crafts, science, science booth, um, there's art contest submissions. So uh, big uh, emphasis on that. I love to watch the kids that after they get their stick with their watermelon on it, <clears throat> when a monarch but butterfly lands on their butterfly—I mean, on their watermelon—how exciting that is! I think it's exciting to <laughs> to have that butterfly on my watermelon stick. <clears throat> Flowercade uh, is a program sponsored by the Garden Club Council of Fort Worth. And we've participated in this since 1987. This fall, I mean this spring, we're having a workshop by uh, Barbara Baker on floral arranging in an effort to stimulate some interest and educate our members uh, to be able to progress and, and possibly participate a little bit more in this program. The docents program has been in effect for 19 years. Uh, volunteers have been trained as docents who, who have provided public tours and education at the, at the Botanical Garden. There have been changes in the program, uh, but plans are to continue to provide, to provide tours. One of our newer programs that we expect to continue is the Wall for Our Tidy Up program. And the Garden Club adopted this trail as part of the great, Keep Grapevine Beautiful program and it's a great way to get a little exercise and we go out and walk and pick up trash on this trail near 121 and Hall Johnson. As an, ex as an example that even though you see that there's a lot of programs that we are participating in and will in the future, we're still 
eager to be involved in improving our environment and our community. So in October, members of our club are going to be participating in the Six Stones project. This project makes exterior repairs to homes of veterans or struggling homeowners. And we will be going into the home, um, actually not into the home, but uh, going to the homes prior to their work to do some yard work to prepare for them to be able to, to make, make their efforts. I like this. In 1932, Nellie Trigg, she was president of the Texas Federation of Garden Clubs, said, the community that beautifies its approaches and its public grounds and vacant lots and encourages home gardening in the community that will always attract immigration, which was tra translated to new residents, and flourish commercially. The population of Grapevine in 1932, as you heard earlier, and most of you know, was approximately 1,000. And it's now over 54,000. If what she says is true, these efforts to plant trees, shrubs, flowers has attracted new residents to our city and it has definitely flourished commercially. So our club is very proud to have been a part of this beautification. Our efforts have been supported by many organizations in the city. Um, you can see them on this slide. And we, we make a big thank you to the Grapevine Parks and Recreation Department. We've partnered in so many activities. We can't do it without you all. So, so in closing, I'd like to thank all of our members, friends, and organizations for all of your support. It's wonderful having you here to share with us this, our 90 years. So thank you. want to uh, permanently uh, celebrate the 90th anniversary of the Great Mountain Garden Club by having a living legacy tree planted in the Great Mountain Botanical Gardens. Uh, today we will announce that and give, the, give you this. And uh, uh, there is, uh, it's from the friends, not the friends, but the friends of the Great Mountain Garden Club. Uh, myself, Doug Evans, Chris Smith, Roy Robertson, other people, you all too, may join in this. As you well know, the, the Living Legacy Program will plant a tree, identify it with a marker. The size of the tree, though, depends on the amount of money that we, that we get. We're going to leave it open for one week. Whatever we have after a week, I know it's going to be close to $1,000. <laughs> have a big tree to plant. It may be in conjunction, Mayor Tate was telling me about a house that's going to be relocated there soon. And maybe that's one of the first landscaping things that we do there. But on behalf of uh, Morris Campground Consulting and friends of, of the Grapevine Garden Club, congratulations and may you have many more years. Thank you very much.